There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. And all
Welcome Flight Life and Lighthouse members again to our, um, I think the fourth, the fourth hybrid service, uh, November 8th, and we are going to continue our pre-advent series. And today in particular, we will be talking about, is Jesus worth waiting for? Taken from several um, Bible verses from the Psalms. Um, and before that, I would like to invite all of us here and wherever you are at home right now to take a moment of silence and then let's pray together. 
Jesus, as we anticipate the celebration of your arrival here on earth, we want to see and look back to the uh, the old saints and all the believers in the past as they expected the upcoming Messiah when the prophets told them that the Prince of Peace will come in the form of human. And then they wrote so many songs that expressed their faith in the upcoming Messiah. So Lord, with the same understanding, with the same idea, we want to have a like-minded spirit, like-minded um, desire, just like all the Psalms and the old um, saints and uh, old believers in the Old Testament, as we also wait and celebrate the coming of Messiah, Jesus Christ, here today in 2020. So speak to us, Lord, through the lyrics, through the songs, through the sermons that we are going to ponder together, even through the discussion that we are going to have after this, so that we will continue to be edified from the word, through the word, and with the word. Works freely in us, Holy Spirit. Make us humble and teachable, so that you can work mightily in us, and make our heart like a good soil, so that the seeds of your word may fall on us, and then be fruitful multiple times. We ask all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Waiting. Who likes to wait? It's absolutely one of the hardest things to do. Think about some of these examples in regards to wait. Searching for the shortest way on the GPS in order to avoid traffic. I don't like to wait. Finding the shortest line, either at Safeway, Walmart, or maybe Safe on Foot, because I don't like to wait. Carpooling with someone to a meeting. Well, maybe these examples only fit before the corona era. I don't like to wait. And expecting this pandemic to end once and for all, I don't want to wait. And I was a south neighbor, they couldn't wait for the election result. I don't like being on other people's time. When I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go. Waiting for graduation, for holidays, maybe for marriage. The list goes on and on. However, this is something that I found surprisingly interesting about waiting. Waiting is not always pointless or useless. You see in the slide that we only wait on what we believe to be trustworthy, to be reliable, to be unfailing. That's why we wait. So again, we wait, we only wait on what we believe to be trustworthy. And Jesus is so trustworthy and worth waiting for. There's a reason, therefore, why no one in our context is standing in line either at Safeway, Walmart, Safe One Foods, where the cashier or the register is empty. And there is a reason, an absolute reason, acceptable reason, why no one is sitting at the McDonald's drive through waiting to place their order while no one is coming or serving. In those regards, waiting is pointless. We only wait on what we believe to be trustworthy, reliable, and unfailing. And Jesus is trustworthy, reliable, and unfailing. A study in the Psalms will confirm this reality because it relates to God. The phrase, wait on God, is always an affirmation of the reliability or the trustworthiness of God to come true for his people. Not only that, the phrase wait on God and hope in God are used often 
synonymously in the book of Psalms. There are some Psalms examples that I want to show for today's sermon. Psalm 25, verse 3, 5, and verse 21. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. For you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait. The you is the object of the psalmist's reason to wait. All the day. Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed. For I take refuge in you. For I wait for you. And then Psalm 33, verse 20 until 22. Our souls wait for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have as we have hoped in or waited for you. Psalms 40, verse 1. I waited patiently, or in another translation, intently, for the Lord. And he inclined to me and hear and heard my cry. Psalm 62, verse 5. My soul wait in silence for God only. For my hope is from him. So the word wait and hope simultaneously being used. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. Now what does it mean to wait on God and or to hope in God? There are at least three things. To wait on God or to hope in God is to see him as your greatest solution to your greatest problem. That's the reason we are waiting. To wait on God, second, is to affirm that he is reliable and trustworthy, no matter what. To wait on God is to put your hope in him above all other things. For to wait is to hope. We only wait on what we believe to be trustworthy, reliable, and unfailing. That's why we wait. And this is not the unsure, I hope this works kind of hope. This hope that we have like the Psalms just show to us, is an affirmation of the certainty and the unfailing trust that we have in God. Some of the reflective questions. Do you wait on God? Do you persist in prayer expectantly before an answer comes? Or do you give up waiting on God after a few days, few weeks, few months? Do you wait on God and look to him throughout your day for your joy? Or are you waiting on a text or maybe Facebook message or a certain numbers of likes and loves, loves on your Instagram post to bring you a sense of happiness? My friends, this is a serious warning. A lack of waiting on God reveals that we are not convinced that God is reliable in answering prayers or bringing true joy to his children. Let me repeat again this part. A lack of waiting on God reveals that we are not convinced that he is reliable in answering prayers or bringing true joy to his children. The unfortunate reality is you and I are all prone to wait on and hope in many things beside God. You and I habitually wait on a change in circumstances, financial issue, person, opportunity, and solutions to our problems. It doesn't come so natural for you and me to wait on God. 
Rather, waiting on God is a spiritual discipline. There is to be cultivated, not something that we can expect will happen automatically. I think this is why we find the psalmist, especially in Psalm 42, 42 and 43, talking to themselves, talking to himself, and commanding his soul to wait for and to hope in God. Consider this prayer from the psalmist. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Interesting self-talk. In the form of prayer. Why are you in despair? O oh my soul. And why have you become disturbed. Within me. To whom this psalm is talked to. To his own soul. In the form of prayers. And then he said to his own soul. Hope in God. Literally wait. For God. For I shall again praise him. The help of my countenance. And my God. So this prayer both in Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 show us two important things. First one, there is a temptation to wait on something other than God. So what are you tempted to wait for? What do you believe is the reliable solution to your current circumstances? Maybe a boyfriend, maybe a husband or a wife, a change in your spouse, character or behavior, maybe a best friend, being in the inner circle of certain group, smaller waist, smaller belly, a job, promotion, successful ministry, more money, more children, nicer things, nicer clothes. Just think about this one and tell me, what would you put in the blank? Next slide. Next slide. So, what you put in the blank is likely what you will naturally wait on, whatever it is. However, we need to be aware that it is easy to use Christian language or Christian vocabulary to disguise a misplaced hope. In one of my experiences, I exposed a commonly accepted Christian phrase, spiritual vocabularies like this. This is one of the common examples I found in my previous ministries. I'm waiting on God to bring me my wife or husband. I have heard about this Christian phrase or spiritual vocabularies or language from many young Christians in the past. The problem with this is that they are not waiting for God. The object of their wait is a wife or a husband. God is just the channel through which they will get the husband or the wife they want. God is meant to be the object for our waiting. Not the waiter. To bring things that we wait. He is not the waiter or the waitress. God should be the object of our waiting. And second things from the Psalms 42, 43. Show us that waiting is not passive. Waiting is active and dynamic. It is a continuous and active looking to God. As the answers to all problems and unfulfilled longings. It is a conscious choice. To persist in seeking God, no matter what. Not a subconscious existing between prayer requests. It is a fight to continually refocus the hope of our souls onto God alone. It is the constant reminding of our souls that God is trustworthy, reliable, and unfailing. And He will come through. Through waiting on God. Is crucial when prayers remain unanswered. And when God seems distant and silent. It is just as necessary in fruitful seasons. When we are prone to complacency. And even self-reliance. 
So only through communion with God do we find fullness of joy, abundant life, and help in every circumstance. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, in his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. John 10 verse 10, Jesus said, and John 14 verse 6, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I came to bring life abundantly. Psalm 33 verse 20, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In every circumstance, in every unfulfilled longing, in every problem and pain, may we affirm that our God is reliable, trustworthy, and unfailing by waiting on Him. God is faithful and trustworthy. He is as sure as the coming of the dawn. We are His people and we wait on Him alone. Keep the eyes on your soul. Keep the eyes of your souls set upon God because He will not disappoint. I came across to a book, The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. Tozer made the following observation. He said in his book, The Pursuit of God, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. This is uncomfortable truth. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he, he has hurt him deeply. To put it another way, God cannot do much with people who have not passed through a time of suffering. Sickness, sacrifice, or struggle. How can we be a blessing to people who are going through the hardships of life if we ourselves somehow have been excluded, have been exempted from such hardship. However, when we have been through these things, ourselves, we taste it by ourselves, the sufferings. Two things can happen. First, we have a better testimony about God, about what God has done in our lives. And second, we can be a real comfort and encouragement to others who now are passing through what we already have faced in the past. We can tell them about a God who can sustain them and preserve them through whatever circumstances life throw at us. My wife and I have no idea the pain of being um, in the situation having miscarriage until we experience ourselves twice. I don't understand the pain, the agony of having the heartbeat of a small baby, small human inside of your wife's womb. And then that baby passes away. The heartbeat stops. But because of that experience twice, now we can comfort. Be in the same shoes, in the same boat of those who experience miscarriage. Most of us prefer an approach to faith that will keep us from dealing with suffering and struggle. But there is no such thing as like, like that. In fact, many Christians are under the mistaken assumption that the whole point of establishing a relationship with God is so that they can be kept from such things. Jesus doesn't come to the world so that we do not have to suffer. Jesus come to the world so that we know how to suffer. Let me repeat again. Jesus doesn't come to the world so that we don't have to suffer. Jesus come to the world so that we know how to suffer gracefully and with dignity. Waiting is hard and hurtful. But Jesus is worth far more than just our wedding. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. 
your hidden glory in creation now reveal in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. You didn't want have heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, yet your love was greater. Now what could separate us? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. How sweet is your name, Lord. How good you are. And we love to sing your name, Lord. We love to sing it through you. Death could not hold you. The fail tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grief. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. What a beautiful and powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the reminder. Not only that weight can be hard and hurtful, but also it reminds us that we only hope, we only wait because we believe that you are worthy to be waited for. You are reliable and unfailing. And that's what we do. And we endure to wait for you. Not only to come and then to heal the world where we all are in, where we all are global, globally struggling. We also wait for you. For you alone that we wait. So help us, Lord, to cling on you regardless the situation that we all are in. Because these two shall pass. And we will behold you face to face. The object and the only one and the reason why we wait. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are worthy. You are beautiful. And you are powerful. Name of Jesus. We praise you. And we honor you. In Jesus Christ, and we ask and we pray. Amen.